Uh, today we're continuing the uh, conversations on Farham Nisa's aid, and I'm with uh, Chris Durkin, the president of the Union of National Museums in uh, He is the former director of the Tate Modern. Uh, thank you, Chris Durkin, for accepting our invitation. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a very big pleasure to be able to speak with you. Um, you like people, uh, everyone is uh, speaking about the Tate show still, and um, and you, uh, you initiated it. So I'm, uh, I would like to start talking about like how did you get to know about Farah Nisazi's work, considering that there hadn't been much of uh, literature in English covering her work. Uh, there were some exhibition catalogs uh, around. So I'm curious how did you get to know her work and which was the first work that you saw? So there was a, a buzz about the work of Faronisa Zaid since the establishment of the Istanbul Modern in 2004. And then there was another buzz, of course, uh, when the exhibition opened in 2006 at Istanbul Modern of Faronisa and Nejat Devrim. So this was uh, one of the first things which came across to us when I was still working at the Haus der Kunst in Munich, because the Haus der Kunst in Munich, where I worked before Tate Modern, was uh, a place where we were incredibly interested in artists from other regions and artists from other mentalities, let's say. And when I say this, I have to watch out because I don't want to fall into the trap, uh, which has been going on for so many years, which is uh, the denomination, is Faronisa an Arab artist? Is she a Turkish artist? Mm -hmm. And I don't want to fall into the trap of trying to locate uh, the oeuvre of Faronisa in what we call the Orientalistic trap or the Islamic thing. Mm -hmm. And even until the exhibition in Tate Modern, there are these misconceptions going on about her work. And I remember when I had to moderate a panel at Tate Modern at the occasion of the exhibition, Venetia Porter of the British Museum wrote to me an email uh, giving me a little warning because she says, I should warn you, Chris, that I'm very skeptical about these Eastern influences and especially about the term Islamic. Islamic that keeps cropping up and then she writes I'm interested however in the Turkish contemporaries so there was one set another uh, issue which interested me from the very beginning is that in Istanbul at in 2004 2006 uh, there was very little awareness of the fact that Farun Nisa created these amazing portraits as soon as the 60s already. Uh, it's, that's a second thing. But then the bus continued. The bus was already there in Munich when I created the exhibition, The Future of Tradition, Tradition of Future, revisiting artists from the Middle East. And in that exhibition was, for instance, Salua Raouda Shuker. But the difference between the oeuvre of the Lebanese artist Salua Raoud Shuker and Farah Nisa was, and still is, that she didn't need to be rediscovered. She was discovered for a very long time. I mean, I'm Belgium. And in Belgium, in the Galerie d'Aujourd'hui, in the Palais de Beaux-Arts, I think in the 50s, she was already present. She had an amazing presentation and an amazing presence in Paris, in galleries, and she was in London. She even uh, showed in New York. But still, as soon as she moved to Amman, there was this game going on between what, uh, in one of the fantastic critical essays published around 2015, was called the Arabization of the work of Faronisa. To the point that when uh, in Germany, in Aachen, there was an exhibition organized with the work of Faronissa, which moved to IMA, to the Institut de Monde Arabe, she was, you know, truly presented as an Arab artist. So mm -hmm. there was this whole going back and forth. And even at the time of the show at Tate Modern, I mean, the curators at Tate Modern 
they couldn't help but writing, and I quote, Zayed's abstract vocabulary is an amalgamation of aesthetic elements that can be identified as a synthesis of Islamic, Byzantine, Arab, and Persian influence. This whole game is continuing, is going on. Luckily, uh, we had writers like uh, Adila Laidi Hanye, who the she challenged that view, Venetia Porter challenged the view, and also in the catalog of Tate Modern, Sarah Wilson challenged the view. But two articles helped me to understand what was going on because in 2014, I had the incredible privilege to visit the family of Faranissa Zaid in Amman, mm -hmm. and I was received by the family of uh, Prince Raad bin Zaid Al Hussein, who is another son. Uh, he's not an artist, uh, and I was received by him, and I was received, of course, by one of her most eloquent and most dear students, which is Sua Shoman. Yes. And you know that in the collection of the Shomans, Khalid Shoman, and in the collection of the Zaids of Prince Raad's family and his children, we have many, many other Faranisas, which uh, very few people got to see. Before the show at Tate Modern, I attended the Exeter Biennial, which was curated by Unjini Chu. I also attended the Istanbul, Istanbul Biennial, curated by Karolin Kristo Bakarviev. And at Istanbul Modern, there was a very interesting panel where Adila was present, Adila uh, Laidi Hanye, and he spoke openly about uh, this eternal tension between the Turkish aspect of uh, Faranissa and the so-called Arab aspect. She spoke about the trap of the Islamic thing and she stressed, like she did in the catalog, the late paintings, the late work of Faranissa, which throw a completely other view on the entire oeuvre. And when I speak about the entire oeuvre, I repeat that until I think it was until Sharjah, we left out, because in a way they were embarrassing, we left out many of the portraits. And Faranissa Zaid started already to paint portraits in the 60s. The 60s, the mid 60s until the mid 70s, which I want to stress, was the major crisis in painting worldwide after the Second World War. Create crisis in painting, Immendorf, he said in Dusseldorf, stop painting, Sigmar Polke defined painting, Buren was talking about a certain kind of painting as decor. Everybody started to think about not the end of painting, because the end of painting has always been an issue, but about the crisis in painting. In the midst of that crisis, Faronissa painted these, I think, very difficult portraits, but very challenging portraits, mm -hmm. which reminded me in a way of what we call in the West since the 90s, bad painting, what you can also call a completely way of free painting. Think of Kippenberger or think of Michael Kreber. And I mean, these paintings are absolutely amazing. And What's interesting is that when she established her school in Amman, that she was teaching to students like Sua Shoman only about abstract art, mm -hmm. but at the same time, she concentrated completely on her very frail, very harsh, very difficult portraits. With dilettantism, but they toy around, especially with "I want to do this for myself." I'm. This is what I'm saying, and that's what I have to say, and that's it. Interestingly enough, when I was visiting the house of the family, I found in the attic this amazing, amazing photograph, which I think is a complete premiere. Okay, it's a portrait, it's a portrait done at the end of the 90s, at the end of the 80s, it's a portrait done at the end of the 80s, 89 maybe. In any way, we know that the sitter, and she didn't paint it live, 
but that the person who she portrayed was reacting to it, to his portraiture in a letter sent to her in March 1990. And this is the portrait she painted. Okay. okay. Oh, okay. That is the famous, <laughs> quote unquote, famous portrait. This is the famous portrait of Donald Trump. Okay. Yes. And you see his name, Donald Trump. Yes. <laughs> Donald Trump reacted to the painting as follows. He wrote on March 1st, 1990, and this is the signature of Donald Trump. He wrote to Faronisa, your highness. I have received your portrait, etc. Of course, it is our understanding that you will not offer photographs or copies of the portrait for publication without my express permission. And he's also wondering about the fact why the portrait is so large. Larger, he says, than I had anticipated. So we might run into problems today because now we are publishing this photograph, we are showing this photograph, and we know that Donald Trump is not anymore the Donald Trump of the end of the 80s and the 90s of Playboy magazine and CNN, where he expressed that he wanted to become president, then he withdrew it, but now Donald Trump is the president. So this is a portrait. Don't call it a good portrait. I think it's very, very interesting because it's, for me, a form, not just because of the sitter, but look at his eyes, look at the hairdo. I mean, it's not very elegant. I mean, Donald Trump is not an elegant person, of course, but it's a very interesting portrait. So if you look at the other portraits of the 60s and uh, what she did later, you feel that she is taking risk and she has been taking risks all her life. Think about the Palios Cristalos. And these risks have been addressed in two seminal essays. And the first essay was published in a very, I mean, interesting, open way by Sarah Neil Smith in July 2016. And it's called Faronisa Zeit in the Mega Museum mega museums and modern artists from the Middle East. And in one of the chapters, she is saying, if the denominational contest between Arab and Turkish proved insurmountable in the 1990s, the rigidity of this framework had loosened by the early 2000s. But a year later, we have an article in October 2016 in Asia, Art Pacific by Kevin Jones, who is saying that we didn't resolve the issue yet. And then, interestingly enough, the Sharjah collector Sultan Soud Al Kazimi, he is publishing an article in the National on male chauvinism in art, women represent women better. He's also talking about Faronisa. And for the first time, he's in addressing the presence or the lack of presence of women artists in Middle Eastern art. So things started to loosen up. Things started to loosen up. And Adila, again, Lady Hanier in her book, which was published at the same time as our catalog at uh, Tate Modern, she published this article, a seminal article, essay about the late works of Faronissa, which I agree with her, throw a completely new vo view of the entire oeuvre. Uh, we didn't get there yet at the show of Tate Modern, sadly enough, because we still spoke about, in a way, about the Islamic thing, which mm -hmm. then got critically addressed by Venetia Porter during the debate. However, it was very emotional for me when I got invited to give a lecture at uh, Istanbul Modern in 2015 about the future of the Mega Museum, the future of the museum. And as a backdrop, I had this fantastic painting by Faronisa Zeit of 1951 called My Hell. Was I implying that the future of the Mega Museum was going to be a hell like it is right now? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But thanks to Faronisa, I mean, after the fact, my lecture has even a more double or ambiguous me meaning, talking about the future of the museum in front of my hell. I mean, that's, I say this also because the work of Faronissa, her entire work, is not easy. It's a very complex oeuvre. 
And it is complex because Faronissa is not part of this movement, of that movement. Of course, she was incredibly important for the D group in uh, Turkey and Istanbul when she was there in the 30s and the 40s. But Faronissa, uh, in difference to many, many other artists, goes her way as an artist. She is a completely egotistic artist because she picks and chooses almost where she wants to be in place and time and mm -hmm. also what and which kind of work she wants to make. And what I find interesting is that we see, and they are reproduced quite extensively in the catalog of Tate Modern, we see these fabulous portraits of the 60s and that in her late work, she starts to paint these portraits again. And one of these first new portraits is, of course, Donald Trump. Uh, well, I'm glad you also bring the topics of um, uh, the, the, how you previously know about her work and also how oh, her work should be positioned, uh, how she should be positioned as an artist. Uh, of course, it's your point of view, because those were in the uh, preliminary questions that I sent you, so I'm glad that we, you, you talked about it. Um, because also for in Turkey, and it's an uh, easy uh, way of thinking, and I'm not saying it in an undermining tone, because of the uh, various reasons you also uh, address. Um, it's not a hard thing to think that these approaches might be Orientalist. Uh, mm -hmm. In a similar way that how we know in this, in this many mega museums, in, as well as in like New York galleries or London galleries, there is this rediscovery of especially like female artists or giving more uh, room in the programs to uh, to artists from like people of color or lgbtq so, um, so we are even like thinking whether this is a trend or where it be leading to or this would or whether it might affect how the these artists would be positioned in the global art history. So I'm, I'm, I really appreciate that you address uh, these points and you make your point clear. And uh, the house circle connection is also interesting, please. Farah Nisa Zayt, her oeuvre is not part of this rediscovery thing. Yes. I mean, uh, you can also, when you read Mark Godfrey, his, his fantastic essays, he's a Tate Modern curator, one of the best theoreticians about painting, who is about to publish an essay called Stop Painting, where he describes the fact that suddenly in the new painting by African-American artists, that they address in their paintings the crisis of painting, yes. which, is, which is quite, 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 quite interesting that painting is one of the, the top, top forces in the art market, but that the art market is now going for those artists like African-American artists, Gary James Marshall, Jack Whitten, who address the crisis of painting. Farrell Nissa is not part of this development of this story. One of the most important chapters, I think, of Farrell Nissa is the chapter where she starts to participate in the Salon de Realité Nouvelle. Exactly. The Nouvelle Ecole. It's one of the most exciting moments for me in her work, especially because there are also other women present, like uh, Maria Elena Vieira de Silva or Carmen de Ribas. I mean, uh, these artists are overlooked. Vernissa has been not overlooked. We got deviated from the importance of her work because of the game between is she Turkish, is she Arab? because of the game of the Islamic thing, Orientalistic thing. But now we can look back at all these incredibly crucial moments in her life. And that period in Paris is for me crucial. Also because with the gallery in Paris, she gets representation in New York. She gets representation in London. And at the same time, she's starting to do these portraits, yeah. which, you know, in a way, uh, I call the, I mean, it's very harsh to say, but you cannot call them beautiful in an aesthetical way. I mean, these piercing eyes, these hairdos, these frontal gaze, they're 
masks. I mean, their beauty in their ugly. <laughs> we have and I call them, I call them bad painting in a good way. I mean, like uh, Kippenberg and Michael Kreber. I mean, we have fascinating artists who do that. I would even compare some of her portraits to the portraits of Marlene Dumas. Uh, it's about the freedom of the artist to explore what painting can do to an artist and what are the possibilities of painting. Um, exactly. We now um, at the gallery we have around 20 of our portraits from different periods. We even have like one of the, uh, it's the earliest portrait of hers that has remained today. It's from 2060. Uh, it's an 11 centimeter uh, watercolor portrait of Freya Cora. Uh, so she actually started doing taking portraits in her early career, like uh, right after school, I would say, or like she started in school. Right. So her sketchbooks are also full of portraits work. And as you expressed, like her first uh, oil portraits have a more um, texture and a variety of colors, whereas uh, the Amman portraits have a different aesthetic. And the, the common thing you catch in these portraits are uh, the detail on the face, the, the eyes, like you said, the piercing eyes. And then she almost uh, very similar eyes in many people or the eyebrows. They represent in a way uh, her own look or how she imagined herself as well as the pe person um, that she wants to uh, portray. Um, so we have all the piercing eyes looking at us at the gallery, and it's a it's a, a great privilege actually. Um, it's the first show of hers that's only comprised of her portrait works. So we're also very grateful to the collectors who agreed to loan the works to us. Um, so um, I'm also glad that you brought up the House Derklin's connection. Uh, years after that, uh, Oakley and Mesor uh, created a show on um, uh, the post-war. Uh, and that period, uh, he had Farhanisa's work, which I find it very significant on marking her position in the global art history, not contained to a region of one specific uh, approach, but it's a um, general uh, coverage of the period. It would have even been more courageous to present in post-war instead of my hell. <laughs> True. <Portraits. laughs> True, but I think also the, uh, the museums like to collaborate in such uh, shows. Uh, they're more significant. So um, I really thank you very much for your wonderful explanations. That was really um, very helpful for me. Uh, to know uh, how uh, passionate you are uh, with her work. And also I believe people who watch this will feel the same. I was not the only one. When I started this uh, conversation with you, I said there was a buzz all around about the work of Farnisa. And of course, I was not the only one at Tate Modern buzzing about it. I mean, Jessica Morgan, who is now at Die Art, the Art Foundation, she buzzed the word Farnisa Zeit uh, Francis Morris, I mean, uh, uh, Sheena Wagstaff was buzzing about the name uh, Faranissa Zeit. Of course, uh, so, uh, Shua Shoman had an incredible influence on our thinking because the program of Darat Al Fanun is so important. I mean, I was not the only one. And that says a lot. I mean, her work was picked up for different reasons, maybe by so many different people at the same time. People who gave the so-called crisis of painting are painting by women really, really, really serious thoughts. And that says also about Faranissa, it was not a rediscovery. Exactly. It, was, it, was, it was always on, in the mind of several people at the same time for many, many different reasons. And I cannot say uh, enough how important the work of uh, Adila, Adila Laidi Haine has been in that sense as well. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Um, two years ago, we had a show. Again, it was a, a lot of works on loan. Uh, and it was right after the Tate and uh, Deutsche Bank Kunzale exhibitions. 
So we had overlapping works uh, because not many Turkish audience could see could visit London or Berlin, and we wanted those works to be at least to be seen in the public uh, because it was only in newspapers. So uh, luckily, uh, many of the collectors again agreed to loan the works as well as uh, the family. So we had some of the masterpieces in the gallery. And in line with that show, we also um, published a Turkish version, and it's a slightly extended version of Adila Laydeni's book. Um, and um, we are very thankful uh, for getting to know her, and we're in close collaboration. I think it's really valuable uh, what she's been doing on researching, continuous research on Farhan Nisazade's work. Well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. Pleasure. <laughs>